So you tripped, fell, and broke your shoulder. We have a shoulder specialist here to talk about the proximal humerus fracture. Very common. Thanks for joining us, Dr. John Haverstock. Welcome to Talking with Docs. I am Dr. Paul Zalza. I'm Dr. Brad Wayne. And I'm Dr. John Haverstock. So what's the skinny on the broken shoulder? Yeah, broken, fractured, of course, means the same thing. Sometimes that's confusing. But uh, it's probably, I'd say, maybe the third most common fracture. And, and usually we, it can happen in young people from a vigorous fall. It can happen in older people from a fall from standing height. So it's considered one of the fragility fractures if you're older and it's a low energy injury. And uh, they can happen in all different shapes. Okay, so the, the shoulder is made up of the humerus mm -hmm. and the glenoid. Yeah. The top of the humerus is a ball and then a, sort of a flat socket is your glenoid. And the fracture we are talking about is that proximal humerus or the top part of the humerus uh, that makes up part of the shoulder joint. Third most common, so that'd be falling like wrist and ankle you got probably. Yeah. All right, so it's a pretty common fracture. Um, so I've got, I've fallen, I hurt my shoulder, I think it might be broken, what do I do? So you need an x-ray. <laughs> That's all you need. Uh, <laughs> so to make the diagnosis, x-ray is common, it's easy to obtain, uh, quick, and uh, there's, it's, it's not a hard diagnostic uh, diagnosis for your family doctor or an emergency room doctor to make, and they'll give you a sling. A sling is going to help a lot, but it's still going to be painful. You know, it's going to hurt quite a lot for the first days. It can be difficult to get comfortable at night specifically, and every week it's going to be a little bit better. You want to see a specialist to kind of determine if a sling is the right treatment and when to start physiotherapy, or if you might on occasion need surgery. So early on, what people are going to present with is pain mm -hmm. and a loss of function, right? So people are like, well, how am I going to even know if I need to go get an x-ray? And usually it's significant pain and a loss of function of that limb. That's right. All right, and then you go to your doctor, you get a, they do a history, physical examination, then order the x-ray. That pretty well gives a diagnosis. And now we've hit a crossroad. Are we going to treat this operatively or are we going to treat this non-operatively? And that's where you're going to go see uh, a specialist. So let's go down the, let's say you have a fracture that can be treated non-operatively. What's the roadmap look like after? And just before we do that, the way that we decide surgical versus non-surgical treatment is typically the number of pieces, yeah. how far apart they are, and what position they're in. Is that fair to say? Almost all fractures we treat that way. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Okay. So, so sometimes there's one fracture line and just one piece is separated. Other times, three pieces have separated. So the amount of separation, the position that they're in, uh, and the number of pieces are the most important. Uh, and we call that kind of the character of the fracture. Sometimes you know, hey, this is going to be okay. It's going to heal over four to six weeks. And uh, like the non-operative treatment, we started off there. So for, for the majority of them, it's going to be a sling for four to six weeks as things start to feel better you're going to move your hand and your elbow and your wrist to minimize stiffness and you're going to start some gentle shoulder motion uh, usually under the supervision of a physiotherapist to help you minimize stiffness while protecting the healing fracture when are you thinking about starting that movement and obviously it's fracture dependent but yeah. usually around like the three or four week mark is that what we're thinking yeah i i I would say that I do it a little bit earlier. Okay. Uh, uh, certainly hand and elbow motion right away because the swelling goes downhill and sometimes you know it's tough to get a ring off. Sometimes uh, you know the swelling creates a, a problem with hand motion and that's easy to remedy by, by getting moving. A simple uh, pronation, supination, making a fist, opening and stretching out your elbow. So start those right away. Yeah. With the, at the shoulder or the proximal humerus, you probably start two to three weeks depending on how things are going and it's really gentle. It's guided by yourself with some supervision uh, from the therapist. You know, you can use your other hand to do some gentle motion, but if it hurts too much, you're probably doing too much. If you're one of my patients and you come into my clinic, this is my usual thing is zero to two weeks, you're nothing in a sling. Yeah. Two weeks to four weeks, you're doing pendulum exercises yeah. where you just bend over and let your arms swing around mm -hmm. uh, like a pendulum. Then weeks four to six, that's where you're doing that passive range of motion, helping with the other arm. And then six weeks beyond, you're going to a physiotherapist. That way I'm just saving my breath. So if you come in my clinic, I can just show you this video. Well, what I tell a lot of people too is, um, with respect to the elbow exercises, imagine you had a piece of paper or a towel under your arm. Yeah. You're allowed to move it as long as that towel doesn't move. Because the things that hurt and are bad for the fracture early on are forward flexion and abduction. That's what angulates out the fracture site. 
Yeah, exactly. That's a good way of putting it because every time you bring your arm away from your body, that's putting stress at the fracture. But with your elbows tucked, you're safe. And this is usually where I lead into how do you wash under your arm. I tell people, don't try to lift it and wash. Let your arm drop down, lean forward, wash, and then come back up. And then gravity is pulling it down. We always like to use gravity to straighten fractures out when we can. So that's the way you can still wash your arm. It doesn't hurt as much and it doesn't move the fracture. Okay. Talking about hurting as much too, a lot of people say, oh man, the first couple of weeks it's very painful, <laughs> yes. difficult to sleep. So I've um, heard a lot of people, you know, for the first two weeks they sleep in a lazy boy chair. Yeah, I think so just or, like we're sorry, talking. lazy person chair. <laughs> <laughs> just like you're saying with gravity, I think being upright helps align things. So when you're on your back, it's harder to be comfortable. Maybe a pillow under the elbow, but for most people, a bunch of pillows, sleeping on the couch, being that semi-sitting, semi-upright position seems to help. And I think that's a good point about the pillow. So it's when you're sleeping, but when you're sitting, we don't really want you to have a pillow propping it up. Because imagine if you have a fracture here and you prop it up, it actually can angulate the fracture. When you're sitting, you want to hang down, put the pillow behind so that it doesn't fall back. All right, that's so there you've got a lot of information about that first six weeks after you've had a shoulder fracture and you're having it treated non-operatively because it fits the criteria for non-operative management. And beyond six weeks and, um, and beyond, is it's all about physio. Physiotherapy, physical therapist to get that range of motion back. Reason being, because the most common complication after a shoulder fracture is? Stiffness. That's yes. it. We're going to talk about that after. It's really hard to get your motion back. And sometimes we can say, you know, it's never going to be the same. And other times with the right therapy, you'll, you'll get back to normal. But the shoulder is so mobile, it's hard to get that motion back. I tell people you can get to the point where you can touch the top of your head and then we're all high-fiving because that's a pretty good outcome after a shoulder fracture. Okay, so now we've done through the non-operative people. So they're through their course. What about the people that have a fracture that the pieces are too far apart, or there's too many pieces, or it's in a bad position and they require surgical intervention? What are the surgical choices? Yeah, so most commonly we're going to try to piece things together with a plate and screws. So that's if all your parts are in decent shape, they're just separated too far, we're going to line them up. Uh, we call it an open reduction, making an incision in the front usually, lining up the fragments and holding them with the plate and screws. We also put stitches in to kind of help the tendons stay in the right spot. That's the most common surgery, I would say. And, and, and then sometimes when the ball, the cartilage ball is too injured or too damaged, we would suggest a shoulder replacement. Right. Right off the bat. You came in with a broken shoulder and left with a shoulder replacement. That would be not the most common, but definitely uh, happens. And sometimes, you know, it's going to give you the best outcome. Okay. And, those, and if you are reading your radiology report, uh, lots of different pieces is referred to as comminution. Right. And if they're moved far apart, that's called displacement. Right. And, and think of it with respect to the replacement. Your shoulder's kind of like an ice cream cone. And when you break below the ice cream and the ice cream falls off or is too far away and the blood supply is compromised, that's when we think about replacing it. We actually have videos about shoulder replacement as well as reverse total shoulder replacement that may be amenable for this type of fracture. Ice cream cone. Ice cream cone. Who right. doesn't like ice cream? Yeah, buddy. All right. So that's, and then, so the roadmap after your surgery, let's say you had one of those open reduction internal fixation surgeries. What's that six week roadmap look like after that? Yeah, I think the advantage is one, we're lining up your bones and two, you can get moving more quickly. So you, to take advantage, you really have to get moving a bit sooner. And usually we leave the operating room and we can give you instructions on, this is how far you can reach and this is when you should start physio. And it should be within the first two weeks for gentle motion at least. Okay, so one of the hallmarks of the post-operative period of an open reduction internal fixation is early range of motion. With this shoulder fracture being treated non-operatively, we're being careful not to move it too much. Like we said, the first two weeks, nothing. Two to four weeks, some pendulum. Four weeks to six weeks, passive range of motion. After you've had surgery and had some metal or screws to hold the fracture in place, early range of motion is key to minimize that stiffness that is inevitably going to occur down the road. That's right. What if you had, instead of the open reduction internal fixation, you had the shoulder replacement surgery? What's that roadmap look like after? When we do the shoulder replacement, the ball and the shaft are strong right away, but we are a bit more concerned about the tendons as they attach to these fragments called the tuberosities. For, so for that, you really have to follow the surgeon's direction because sometimes they're strong right away and other times they need four to six weeks to heal. Okay, so you may not have that aggressive range of motion after a shoulder replacement. 
And that would be a decision you would make during the procedure where you would test it and you'd say, oh, I'm confident that we have really good fixation or I'm not quite as confident. That's right. Every surgery is going to be different. Okay. And when you're signing that consent form, it's going to say arthroplasty or hemiarthroplasty. That's what you're going to see. Those are the words we use for shoulder replacement. Okay. Whenever we talk about surgery, we always talk about risk. So this is typically with a general anesthetic, right? You can't you can't, you can't have a high spinal and have a shoulder fracture surgery. So people are going to sleep. So as we get older, yeah. going to sleep is a little more complicated. Yeah, very commonly there is, you know, a, a freezing around, we call the brachial plexus at, the t at your neck that'll make your arm numb for the day. So, so sometimes a general anesthetic isn't uh, a big general anesthetic, but, uh, but just enough to keep you relaxed and unaware. Uh, but yeah, there, there certainly are risks. You have to have your head up. So if someone has a poor circulation to the brain, there's a very small but real risk of a stroke. Uh, and then all of the other things that come with opening the skin, infection, a ner injury to a blood vessel or a nerve. Um, are there any important nerves in this area that we specifically worry about? Yeah, often, often the axillary nerve, that's the nerve that makes your deltoid muscle fire and that's the bigger muscle on the outside. Often that's injured and it can be hard to know that beforehand because it's hard to ask you to do all these motions and test it, but very commonly that's injured and it comes back on its own. Sometimes it doesn't and you need a few nerve tests to sort that out. All right, and the chicken dance is very difficult if you don't have an axillary nerve function. If you're going to a wedding, I'm just saying. So just saying. All right, so basically, uh, and of course with any surgery, it's always things like heart attack, stroke, death, blood clot, infection, pneumonia, bad things can happen, but of course we take precautions to minimize the chance of something bad happening. And now, just in general, even with surgery, either open reduction, internal fixation, hemiarthroplasty, or treated non-operatively, the thing we worry about is stiffness after. That's probably the most common complication after these types of injuries and interventions. That's a pretty good summary. You figure? Yeah. yeah. All right. The most important thing is do your best to try to avoid falling. Like any of our injuries, the best way to deal with this is to not get the injury. But if you do, seek treatment quickly, follow the instructions of your surgeon or your healthcare provider, and work hard to get your motion back after it's all fixed. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. Dr. Haverstock, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. <clears throat> Remember, you are in charge of your own health. We'll see you next time.